say somebody like me who uh, ultimately the decision of whether or not my class exists next year is not going to be up to me. It, it's going to be up to somebody above my pay grade. But let's say I'm told that you get to do class because the, the public health official has decided in your area that school can resume and there's going to be some new rules at school. So there's going to be some distancing rules. There's going to be maybe some maximum class sizes uh, so that you can spread out more. Let's say all those things are in place, right? And you've got uh, some as many mitigators as the school can help us achieve. Do you then, in, just in your opinion, do you, if you're me, do I still tell my classes we're not singing? Or do, do we kind of trust that that whole scenario has been factored into some bigger picture risks and we go ahead and sing with teenagers? I think in the scenario you described, I personally would feel safe proceeding. Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. I'm Chris Muntz, and this is episode 36. Are we asking all the right COVID questions? With Dr. David McKenzie of Research Medical Center. In this episode, I bring you a substantially in-depth conversation with another expert physician who specializes in infectious disease and is on the front lines of treating COVID-19 patients. Humans have a strong bias towards pessimism and the disregarding of any good news. As a result, we tend to trust bad news without question and demand proof for good news. We apply this imbalanced approach to evidence to our peril. We should be making an effort to understand as broad of a picture as we possibly can. So the goal of this episode is not to paint the situation with rose-colored glasses. In fact, later on in the conversation, you're going to hear explanations of the very scary aspects of this virus and why the, the societal response to this has been relatively unprecedented, extremely unprecedented. However, we will be weighing these things against the positive developments that have occurred and continue to occur. We will also spend a good deal of time in this conversation discussing the flaw and the folly, you might say, of thinking about risk in terms of a binary. In other words, is something safe or is it unsafe? Which is an error that many people make in, larger, in the larger conversation of life as well. In fact, most things can't be quantified that way. They can't be quantified as safe or unsafe. They can be quantified as how safe and how unsafe. It's a spectrum, not a switch that we flip. And with choral singing, if we look for, if our goal is to find a flip switch that will turn off the danger completely, then we will never find it. So this conversation also goes into that kind of detail and asking the, the questions that would lead a person to understand where are we on that spectrum and where could we expect to be on that spectrum in the next few months versus the next few years. So with all that's going on in the world and, and how critical this issue is to us in our profession and one of, the, one of the things that we are wrestling with, of course, in a broader society now, we're wrestling with this alongside a lot of unrest and civil dispute and angst that we are all really concerned about. Uh, we've got a lot to worry about already, and this conversation that you're about to hear is already quite long, so I've decided to offer this conversation up without any advertisements or any product placements, just to make it a little bit shorter so that you can get through all of it. But one of the things that allows me to do that is the awesome folks over at my Patreon, patreon.com backslash Coralosophy. We've got a group of producers over there that need a shout out because it's without the help of all those folks over at Patreon and the producers of the show, Christopher Vasquez, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, and Ryan Main, that I wouldn't be able to do this type of research. This has been my full-time job uh, since about early May when the first ACDA webinar came out. I have been on this as pretty much my full-time task in that amount of time. So it's without those folks over there doing that work to help me keep this, uh, the lights on in this program, I wouldn't be able to do any of this work. So thank you so much for your help there. Without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation. And it's long, so feel free to pause and come back later. The beauty of this uh, YouTube channel slash podcast channel is that you can come back at this uh, whenever you need to, but there is really important information here all the way to the end, so I encourage you to stick all the way with it in the next few days. Well, hello, I'm here with Dr. David McKenzie, 
David McKenzie is a, an infectious disease specialist here in Kansas City, where I live, at Research Medical Center. And I'm really excited to have him on the show so he can continue to educate us about this, uh, of course, critical issue that we're up against in our profession in choral music and in education more generally. Uh, so, Dr. McKenzie, welcome and tell us about yourself. Well, thanks very much, Chris. I'm delighted to be here. I'm an infectious disease physician. I'm in private practice and I am primarily a clinician in the COVID epidemic. I've been on the front lines taking care of uh, quite a few people who have COVID. Uh, and what, where are your, where's your primary, um, I had mentioned research medical center, but I know in an email you said you pop around to, to some other places. What's a day in the life for Dr. McKenzie look like? I also work at Menorah Medical Center and Belton Regional Health Center, and we have an office uh, that's close to Research Medical Center where we see outpatients. Okay, excellent. Uh, so the way I'd like to jump into this is I, I know that when I uh, monitor on in a lot of online conversations among my colleagues, um, I see a lot of just kind of basic layperson disagreement about how to process everything that we're dealing with right now as a society, but also as a profession. So what I would like, what I would call just COVID-19 and uh, virus basics that, that I feel like uh, many of us don't understand. Uh, so I've got some, we'll call it COVID basics uh, to talk through and see if you can explain them to us. One of the ones that I notice is that many people don't seem to recognize that there is um, a COVID-19, which is a disease, versus SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus, and that getting infected with SARS-CoV-2 does not necessarily lead to being diagnosed with COVID-19. And how and where is how, how would you explain that to a person who doesn't understand? Yes, the terminology can be confusing. The name of the virus that causes the illness is SARS-CoV-2. And by way of background, SARS-CoV-1 was the cause of the SARS outbreak that occurred in Asia back in 2003. The current virus is different, but has a number of uh, similarities to, to the 2003 SARS virus. The virus then causes a disease that is referred to as COVID-19. So a, a way of thinking of this would be that, for example, HIV AIDS, the virus is HIV, but the disease is AIDS. And so with uh, COVID, we're, there is one terminology for the virus and one for the disease that it causes. Now, is, is there a similarity there between AIDS and, uh, and the SARS viruses, the coronaviruses more broadly, in that uh, is it true, or at least generally true, that any virus would have some subset of the population that when infected with the virus, they don't end up getting the disease later? Yes, uh, that does uh, vary considerably from virus to virus, but with uh, most types of infection, there is a subset of people who will be exposed to the either bacteria or virus and may be asymptomatic, whereas other people may have life-threatening manifestations when exposed to the exact same microorganism. Right. Okay. Excellent. Uh, another one that I see, that, uh, and this is probably one of the biggest ones societally that I, I find to be a, a misunderstanding, and that is the difference between uh, case fatality rate and infection fatality rate. And I think that this kind of plays into the conversation we just had about understanding exposure to the virus versus actually coming down with the disease. Uh, that, how would you describe uh, the difference between those two numbers? And, and more importantly, how we as a public who is all of a sudden um, aware of stuff like this, uh, how, how do we interpret those numbers? You know, what do we, if we see a case fatality rate posted on the news, what is that number for? And then now I know that the CDC is coming out with a bunch of uh, more information looking back through April about what the infection fatality rates are. What is the difference and why do we care? Yes, I can start by defining those two terms, case fatality rate versus infection mortality rate, and discuss the difference. Uh, a case, by definition, is someone who has come into contact with the medical profession and has been diagnosed with an illness. So the, uh, And then the case fatality rate would be the percentage of those defined cases who pass away. So in the case of COVID, if someone comes to an emergency room and has a positive test, then they become defined as a case. And the percentage of people known to have the disease who die 
uh, that percentage is the case fatality rate. The infection mortality rate is harder to identify because there are a lot of folks out there who either have mild symptoms and don't come in for medical attention and don't get tested at all, or are completely asymptomatic. So the infection mortality rate would consist of everyone who has the infection, whether they're symptomatic or not, and the percentage of that number, which is going to be a lot larger than the number of defined cases who pass away. The only way to clearly identify the infection mortality rate is to do a research project and have people go out into the community and test a lot of people, some of whom don't even have symptoms, to try to define that population who have an infection, whether they are symptomatic or not. Okay, yeah. Now, uh, to the other part of my question then, and this is where I feel like uh, people had a, had started to create a different picture of the risk that posed that we are faced with uh, with this virus, because as you mentioned, uh, the case fatality rate is easier to define. Let's say in a, in, a, in an outbreak of a new virus, uh, you can define that relatively quickly because you're measuring how many cases have been confirmed and how many pass away as a result, and and finding an infection fatality rate. Uh, takes quite a bit more time. And what I started to notice in conversations among lay people about this is that uh, that there seems to be, let's say, uh, WHO early on in the pandemic released a number that was like 3.8 or 4% or something of case fatality. And then people started to conflate that with among everyone who comes across the virus, four people will die, or every hundred, four people will die, whereas infection fatality rate is quite a bit of a lower number. And so is it fair to say that those numbers serve two different purposes? Yes, you, you make an excellent point, which is that the case fatality rate tends to over-exaggerate exactly how lethal the virus is because uh, it's a smaller denominator, and so the, the percentage is going to look higher. So you're correct that in the early days, we thought that more than 1% of people with COVID died and only as additional studies have been done, which have looked at a larger population of individuals as a more accurate mortality figure than uh, developed, which is less than 1%. Yeah, in fact, I've got right up here on the screen right now, the, the CDC website um, that actually I've been looking at every every day for the last couple of weeks. Um, but, and I wanna get your thoughts on this. Uh, first, how reliable is is it, in your opinion, uh, number two, just what your thoughts about what that means for us. So, for example, I'm looking at, in fact, I can probably even just share the screen with you so that you can see what I'm talking about here. Um, I'm looking at uh, percent of infections that are asymptomatic, best guess, 35%. Uh, and then I'm looking at of those of those who become symptomatic, which appears to me to be the other 65% uh, of the people who become symptomatic. We have bro broken down by age range here uh, some some case fatality or some some case hospitalization ratio and symptomatic fatality ratio. So, what do you see there that, and what can you explain to us about that? Yes, this data from the CDC quantitates the risk of mortality in various age groups and demonstrates that older individuals are at higher risk for dying from COVID. Yeah, so it kind of gives us some valuable information, I would see about, I would think, as a population of who is the most vulnerable, who would need to be um, protected in, in what kinds of ways, I, I would say. Um, and I It's a fairly standard metric that public health officials use to describe the mortality rate, um, but with the caveat that as we discussed, to be included in, in this population, you have to be diagnosed with COVID. So this does not represent the broader population in which there are undiagnosed cases or people who are asymptomatic. Right. This little box that I'm kind of hovering around right here, symptomatic case fatality ratio uh, among people who are uh, that show symptoms, and let's see, and you just stop me if I'm interpreting this correctly. These are people who show symptoms and have been in contact with the healthcare system and been diagnosed. Is that who this is talking about? 
All of that is correct. Okay, and so there we're there we're seeing that um, 0 0.004, so it's four in a thousand, is the overall uh, mortality there that the CDC is currently uh, showing, and then down here. This re refers to percent of infections that are asymptomatic. So that would be of the people who uh, become infected, about a third approximately won't show any symptoms at all. Am I still on? You're absolutely correct. Okay. And so in order to then kind of understand the overall picture, then this overall number over here, this 0.004 or four in a thousand, um, refers to... Uh, well, if you're going to translate that into a possible later on down the road infection fatality rate, the number would end up being lower than that. Correct. Okay. Just making sure that anybody listening and trying to follow along, uh, it, you know, I think that's the, the reason that interests me so much uh, is because I do see so many conflations with that, that crude case fatality rate number we see on the news. Um, and I think that's an important bit of information. And uh, you get just because again, it, to me, it, the, the idea is that if I'm trying to wrap my mind around how dangerous it is for me to do something, I, I kind of want to know the big zoomed out picture uh, of that. So it, it, am I, am I crazy by thinking that's important information? No, that's very important because you can't live your life in a bubble. And at some point you have to decide what risks am I willing to take to start resuming a normal life? Right. And, and so to me, it's, it's, it feels like important information because if I'm going to, um, like you said, know what risks I want to take to resume a normal life, um, then I would need to know those types of stats about COVID-19 and then factor that into the overall risk picture of just existing on the planet and leaving my house. And do you think it's too soon for any kind of infection fatality rate to, to be even guessed at at this point? Well, with these sorts of uh, issues during a pandemic, the more time elapses, the more data is gathered, the sharper the conclusions that scientists can draw. So uh, in the case of COVID, we are now in the fifth month. So we do have quite a bit of data that's, that's uh, been gathered that's, that's helpful. Uh, but I think in a year or two, we'll have a much sharper picture of the actual mortality rate. Right. Of course, as, as the, the evidence that starts to come in becomes vetted and peer reviewed and climbs that evidence triangle, you always see um, when talking about the scientific method. That's good. So what, uh, to sum that part of the conversation up, if you could, what, what do you think we know now, even in early June, that we didn't know in early March? that might be significant for the average person, the lay person, just to understand uh, how risky is it to go outside your house? Is there any new information that we that would help the average person know and be able to calculate their own risk in that way? Yes, there are uh, emerging data that have demonstrated that certain people are at much higher risk for bad outcomes from COVID than others, uh, the most important of which is age. The Age cutoff that seems to be most significant is around 50. The number of hospitalizations in people at age 50 and above increases substantially compared to younger age groups. And then another worrisome cutoff is age 65. Beyond that point, the mortality rate starts to, to really ramp up. Okay. There are some other diseases. Well, age is not a disease, it's just a factor, but there are certain diseases that do increase the risk for bad outcomes from COVID, the most common of which is high blood pressure. Other uh, risk factors include diabetes mellitus, uh, chronic heart disease, and chronic lung disease. Okay. So, what? So uh, yeah, and that all makes sense. And so when we're talking about the context then of kind of understanding how to, to look at the data. Um, how to, um, you know, again, just as a lay person, uh, if you're looking at the news uh, and you see uh, total number of cases in the U.S. and you see total number of deaths in the U.S., you're going to get you're going to get that case fatality rate that's very kind of crude and very broad. Um, if you wanted to, if you wanted to put that in the context of um, 
you know, a public health official that has to make a decision about what types of activities are allowed in their area. Uh, is that the number you're looking at, or are you looking at different information, do you think? One of the other pieces of information that's been very helpful is the risk that one individual will transmit the infection to another and exactly how many individuals can become infected. The uh, epidemiologist used the term R not, not as a small O that's subset below the R. And in the case of COVID, the R not is about 2.1, which means that for every person who's infected, it's expected that two or more other individuals will become infected from, from the source case. So that in the case that this is a very contagious infection, and that plays into some of these public health decisions. Right. So, it, you know, I think that's a good point because the way I've heard it explained, you know, listeners of this show heard me talk with uh, Dr. Adalja about this a, a few weeks ago, where even uh, the, the big thing we're facing, and see if I, you could agree with this or not about the, the way of framing this, is that even as we're learning that the infection for or the infection mortality or fatality uh, is is fairly low in terms of what we're learning versus what we knew back or what those early projections were that it, because it's so contagious i think i've heard him say that the way of thinking about that would be a tiny tiny fraction of a very large number is still a large number uh, when you're talking about uh, the, the the societal impact do you think that's a fair way of describing it Yes, I, I believe so. The thing that makes COVID uh, so frightening is that at the start of the pandemic, no one in the world was immune. This is a brand new virus. And in contrast to influenza, uh, in which you know the virus circulates from year to year, people get vaccines, everybody has some degree of immunity against influenza. In the case of COVID, we were all you know, basically highly susceptible. Now, do you, 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 you're using the past tense there. I'm curious what you mean. Is that changing over the course of the pandemic? Is that, does that have well, that I, change? I, I probably should use the present tense. I've used the past tense to refer to the, the early days of the pandemic a few months ago. Right. But even at this point, a large percentage of the, the world's population are susceptible. There are some emerging data demonstrating the percentage of people in certain populations who have positive antibody test. That's a blood test that indicates that you have been exposed to the virus and have developed some degree of protection. And in uh, New York City, the percentage of people who've been infected is extremely high. It's up to 25%, whereas in more rural areas, the figure is more like 1% to 2%. Yeah, and that's a, that actually brings up another good point. I feel like I see a lot uh, if a news story comes out that indicates uh, that a whole a, a large number of people more than we thought in an area had been infected. Um, I usually see that as presented as bad news. But am I just using my layperson knowledge again, or just layperson logic? It seems like that's both good and bad news. Meaning, if the if the total number of people exposed is higher than we thought, but the deaths are those aren't going to change. You, you get the deaths based on the people who have been in contact with the healthcare system and, and you know all of that. So it, is that a fair way of thinking about it, that that large number is both good and bad news? It's, I think, good news and bad news, because the, the parts of the country where there is a higher percentage of the population showing uh, positive antibodies against the virus have also been disproportionately affected and have had a higher mortality rate. The Looking at this as a glass half full type of scenario, if a the community has a higher percentage of people who have who test positive, then in theory, that community may be at less risk for newer cases down the road because of the so-called herd immunity phenomenon. I see. I see. Now, does that, that larger number, that larger body of people who have been infected, does that also contribute to some of the knowledge that we're gathering about that infection fatality number that we talked about before? Well, herd immunity primarily indicates the likelihood of spread of the virus in the population. If, if a large enough number of people are immune, then it's harder for the virus to get a foothold and, and infect other people. Okay, I understand. Um, another thing I wanted to touch base with you, too, uh, is just the, uh, this is kind of just a personal pet peeve of mine, and I want to get your thoughts on it. 
um, is that we we have been told um, through a variety of sources and media sources and mostly lay people on social media um, that as all of this stuff is uh, coming out that mm-hmm. we're supposed to trust the science and and one of the things that 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 bothers me in this way is that and I don't and feel free to disagree this is an open forum but it seems to me that when you watch science develop you you see a lot of scientists disagree with each other about how to how these things are are should be measured what to what questions to ask which questions to not ask um and to say trust the science implies that there is one monolithic scientific opinion on things and i i just don't see that to be true how do you see that you raise a good point scientists love to disagree with each other and to challenge each other's conclusions the uh, process of scientific discovery is laborious and generally if there's an important topic it's being addressed by several different scientists who may be competing with each other so it is quite rare that there is a study that's done a conclusion that's drawn that immediately changes the scientific community's approach to a problem overnight uh, typically every study has its strengths and weaknesses and if there are 10 studies done on the same topic they may may draw slightly different conclusions. So it basically takes time to build a consensus. Another key tenet of scientific research is that if someone does a study, the community as a whole doesn't really believe the study until until that finding has been confirmed. In other words, I do a study, I, I find one thing. Another investigator across the country needs to repeat my study and confirm it before it's widely accepted as valid. The conclusions are widely accepted as valid. Okay. Yeah. And so then again, with that being the, uh, the the general, the very overview of how science works is that there is no monolith uh, unified opinion on on a lot of things, as, as especially on new problems, like we're dealing with, with this particular virus. Um, and then, and then of course, you, you then have to ask the question of then which experts do I trust on on what to do if they disagree? And, and at which point, for example, we were told a lot to trust the public health expert in our area, but of course then some of them don't agree from, from area to area. Uh, trust the CDC has been replaced with don't trust the CDC because they disagree with the WHO and WHO says one thing on masks, for example, they, they don't agree. Uh, so what the heck do we do? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. It's basically it's a constantly evolving and moving target. And the nature of science is that we never really reach the final conclusion because there always are new studies, new developments. And uh, it's it's a it's difficult. I, I take your point. From my perspective, if I do have the advantage of knowing some of these people personally or having heard them give presentations, so I you know the sources that I trust based on my years of exposure to these individuals. Right. Now, what it, it seems to me, again, I don't have that, that background, obviously. It's why you're here. Um, but it seems to me, and this is kind of just a way that I look at the whole world, which is to already assume that no one person has all of the truth, the monopoly on the truth. That you you need some disagreement back and forth in order to arrive at something that's closer to true, and it sounds like that describes the scientific process in a lot of ways. Is that by bouncing uh, one group, one researcher's opinion and, and findings off of another's is how is where they find the holes in the process. So it seems like, uh, for example, if if at one point in the in the pandemic you f- felt fully that you should trust everything that the CDC says. And then later on, you don't trust what the CDC says. To me, it just seems like more of the same mistake, which is that uh, is is the assumption that one group of people or one group of scientists has the answer uh, about this. And in which case, I guess that's what the job of our politicians is to do: is to decide <laughs> decide who who they're going to believe and, and who they're not. So it, it kind of puts us in that in that tough position. Uh, what are your thoughts? So this is a little bit out of order of my notes here, but what, since I brought up the, the issue of just the simple disagreement, at least last time I checked, uh, which I've been trying to check every couple of days, 
of, of the, the WHO's advice on masks being so different than the CDC's advice on masks. What are your thoughts on that? Right. So these are two reputable organizations, both of which uh, have you know, a huge number of highly qualified employees. Uh, my personal bias, since I've you know, practiced medicine in the United States for many years, is I, I place a lot of weight in what the CDC has to say. And the, the CDC tries to make their recommendations based on so-called evidence-based practices. In other words, they utilize the best science available and they try to grade their recommendations in terms of those that are very strongly supported by available evidence versus those that make sense, but for which there is limited available scientific evidence. Do they have like a coding system for that on their when they make proclamations on their website? What should we look for if we if we want to know what their how strong their recommendation is? Yes, the, on the CDC webpage there is one section for the general public and there's another one for healthcare professionals and but the healthcare professional section is available to anyone. Generally the CDC does have a, a scale and it would depend on the specific recommendation, but there might be five levels of evidence, one being the strongest, five being uh, the weakest. The, the evidence determines on the, the number of accurate scientific studies that have been done, the number of people that have been studied. And uh, so there's there's a, a, a gradation in terms of exactly how strong a recommendation can be. Okay. All right. That's that's very helpful. I just give you, keep people an idea. I, I, I think, uh, at least for me, one of the things I find comforting when I'm listening to a uh, doctor or a scientist um, talk about this process is is when they do what you just explained, which gives me a little bit of a little bit more faith in a, a presenter of information when they acknowledge that there's a possibility that they could be wrong about it. Um, right. You know, in other words, if you're a scientist making, you know, saying, here's a study I did, uh, here are here are some possible limitations to the study I just did. Here's why it doesn't give you the whole answer, uh, but it's still an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, that to me makes me feel like a little bit less like my BS re- radar is going off <laughs> uh, rather than when somebody says, I, f- I did it. I figured it out. It's, you know, we know, we know what to do. Right. I, I completely agree. When scientific papers are published in the medical literature, almost invariably the last Part of the paper is addressed to potential limitations of the study and areas for improvement and areas for future research because there is no study that's going to definitively answer a problem forevermore. Where where do you see, as a clinician who treats patients that have this, uh, where do you see this fitting into the bigger picture of our overall risk at for leaving our house? Yes, I can answer that from two perspectives. One is uh, the patients I have treated and the exposures that they have had. And the second is the medical knowledge base uh, with data from large numbers of studies. Uh, Starting with the medical knowledge base, there's been a lot of new information uh, published just within the last couple of weeks or so that have helped to pinpoint exactly what are the riskiest behaviors, behaviors and how can those be mitigated. It's been shown that the Riskiest uh, situation is to be in close contact with, with a large number of under, other individuals in an indoor environment. Specifically, contact within six feet is the highest uh, risk uh, that a person can have. Okay, so uh, and that's related specifically to COVID, SARS-CoV-2, or do you, would you say that that's also that would be true of probably all respiratory viruses, or does this one get get some special properties in that way? Well, it's an interesting story uh, for influenza and other respiratory viruses. Typically, scientists have advised keeping a distance of three feet or more. But with SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003, there was an outbreak that occurred on a flight from Hong Kong to Beijing in which there was one person infected on the flight, and then about 20 people became infected. Epidemiologists then looked at where these people had been sitting in relationship to the infected passenger, and they learned that the key metric was three passenger rows on the airplane, which translates to about seven feet. So based on that knowledge, it was clear that SARS-CoV-1 
can be transmitted over a longer distance than influenza. And early on with SARS-CoV-2, scientists decided to implement the six feet rule based on that airplane experience from 2003. More recent studies have confirmed that in fact, the six foot uh, rule is very accurate in that people who are exposed to an individual with COVID but are more than six feet away from that individual are at far lower risk for acquiring the infection than people who are uh, in closer proximity to the infected person. Okay, so that's good. So when, uh, good information, because uh, I, I I didn't know, and I've been looking at this a lot, uh, that that there is a particular, I guess, magic number there at six feet because of some, because of SARS-CoV-1. I, I hadn't made that connection before. Um, my question then is, what happens at seven feet? What happens at eight feet? Does the risk continue to fall? Yes, the, the farther a person is from another person with the infection, the better you are. So the, the public health officials now are, are saying that although six feet is an important number, if you can stay farther away than, than that from somebody with infection, your odds of becoming ill are, are improved. They're, they're lower. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And then, of course, for, for those of us who are singers, um, we're, we're kind of jumping around topics now, but that's okay. It's free form. So if we're, we're singing, we've been hearing a lot lately as in the singing profession about how when we sing, we, uh, we propel our droplets and aerosols quite a bit farther uh, than six feet. Um, there have been some disagreements about whether or not the studies that were done in the past translate exactly to this situation or not, but that there is, that we're going to, regardless, we're going to propel our, I've been just saying, I've been calling it spit. We're going to propel our spit farther than when we're just having normal conversation. So does that six foot rule then get obliterated or is it still like at six feet, you're in better, better shape, but if you'd be in even better shape at 12 feet, does that, how does that, how would you describe that? Yes. There's a relatively new term called super spreader. It's been I determined that in some outbreaks of COVID, only one individual is capable of infecting a large number of other individuals if that person is a super spreader. A study demonstrated that people who speak loudly uh, spread more of their droplets into the environment than people who are soft-spoken. And although there has not been such a study done in singers, it would stand to reason that someone who's singing is going to be propelling droplets over a much larger, longer distance than someone who's not a singer. Oh, so, okay, I, that's that's good, too, and helpful. I, I misunderstood that, too. So when, uh, a super spreader is not necessarily a singer, per se. They're just people who tend to, so I guess because of the way I speak, I'm probably a super spreader. I, I tend to, to resonate quite a bit when I, when I speak. Uh, and so just people who are loud and boisterous and use lots of energy in their sound making could potentially be super spreaders if they were to be sick. That's correct. Okay, yes. that, that's really helpful. And then, and so then, what we're thinking at from singers is that we are extrapolating that that if people are loud talkers, they 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 could be super spreaders. So that when we sing loudly, we probably also would be super spreaders. That's correct. And, and yeah, now in your in your understanding, is that still an assumption? We were talking about earlier the like it makes sense, but there's no evidence that kind of thing. Is that still an assumption, or would you say that that's been proven? Well, I, I believe there's strong evidence that, that singers can be super spreaders. There was the outbreak that occurred in a choir in Washington State in March, which you may have heard about. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a particularly devastating outbreak. There was a group of 61 choir members, one of whom was ill, and he infected 50, he or she, we don't know. The gender, but he or she infected 52 other members of that 61-person choir, um, and they were they were all together in practice for two and a half hours. So that was an example of one person who was a super spreader and was spreading a large amount of the virus through droplets, presumably because of singing and, and uh, forceful uh, air movement. Right now, I read I read that CDC report specifically on that case, and I, I find it, had some questions about it that I just want to bounce off of you. Um, the, one of the things it said in there was it, it 
listed out that as one possibility was the singing, but it also listed out a bunch of other things that we now know would be like a, a how not to gather as a group kind of a thing during a pandemic. So their, their spacing wasn't very large, um, like a foot and a half. I think I remember that I'm, I could be wrong, uh, but it wasn't definitely wasn't six feet. Um, they, they shared snacks and food, uh, hugging, you know, that kind of thing. Is it possible that all of that combined as a, you know, in to create a super spreading event? Correct. It, it's hard to tease out a single factor because there were several factors at play. And mm -hmm. you're correct. It's possible that hugging somebody, um, if, if you had the virus on your hands and you, you touched them, you know, that that might be the way that they acquired the virus as opposed to airborne transmission. Right. Okay. Excellent. So that actually brings me then to the next angle that I keep thinking about with this, which we talk about, you could be a super spreader if you do certain things, which I completely understand that all makes sense to me in, in my, again, layperson brain. Um, but if you've got to, you've got to have the virus in order for you to spread it, uh, which I don't think you have to be a, a doctor to tease that <laughs> to tease that out. <laughs> You've got to have the virus in your body to be able to spread it. The act of simply singing isn't going to create the virus out of thin air. You've got to have it. So to me, then the next logical questions to start asking are: What are the the risk factors and the likelihood within your your world that you might enter a room where that virus is present and that that a super spreading event might occur? What are some types of things that you would advise for us to think about in calculating that risk? The uh, risk is going to be much higher if you're in a crowded indoor venue, if you don't know the people. For example, if you're, if you're with your family members and been with them every day for the last two or three months and none of them are ill and they haven't been coming and going, your risk is pretty low. But if you, you go out into a crowd and are not wearing a mask, the, the risk increases substantially. Now, now is there any uh, any aspect there that you would consider to be important and valid in looking at your, your region? That's something Dr. Adalja and I talked about quite a bit. We're looking at um, you know certain things like population density, the case numbers in your area. Um, are they going up? Are they going down? How many People, how many per one hundred thousand people that you've you've got in your area should that be part of the calculation in your mind? Yes, that's a very important part of the calculation. And I might mention that around the hospital where I work, people have been saying, "Gosh, we're very fortunate to live in the Midwest where it's not as crowded. There are wide open spaces." And we were kind of joking about that because in the past the Midwest might have been considered boring because there wasn't as much going on here as there would be in New York City or Los Angeles. But in this case, it's good to be in a less dense area. The, the risk has been extremely high uh, in uh, densely populated parts of New York City. In the Midwest, what has emerged over the past few months is that there are certain hot spots, specifically skilled nursing facilities where elderly people congregate prisons and meatpacking plants. So those are our, our hot spots in this part of the country. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And it, so, yeah, and, and that to me um, is, I think, one of my, my bigger areas of just kind of frustration with how we are as a profession and in, in my, with my colleagues, but also as a society at large, we seem to be extrapolating um, the New York situation onto all of us. Um, meaning that, you know, we could, and of course, my personal theory on that is that most of the major news networks are centered there in New York. Uh, and so that's what those reporters are focused on it, with the big national news and all that. Uh, so they see that that's their life. And I don't want to discount that at all. Um, but then to make the, the leap that those same types of things could happen or would happen here or in other parts of the country that maybe, you know, for example, last time I looked, there was something like, I don't know, close to a thousand counties in the U S that still have zero cases after, after all this time. Um, do you, do you see that as a, a function of just that they got lucky or do, is that a function of the, the way, the way viruses spread more generally? The, I think population density is key. And then the, the corollary to that is how mobile is the population. So if you, are talking about a county, for example, in Wyoming or Montana, where there's a very low population to begin with and people aren't traveling, the risk out there is going to be exceedingly low. 
whereas in Kansas City, our risk is much, much lower than it would be in New York City or Boston, but still not zero. Right. So let's just take, I know it's an extreme example, but it just illustrates a point. Let's say you're in one of those counties that, that still has zero cases at, in, as of June uh, after all this, and you were the public health official there. Uh, would you tell a choir to not meet? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, if the, the problem is that people can be asymptomatic with COVID yet contagious. Right. And as we discussed about a third of people who have the virus have no symptoms at all. Uh, then of the two thirds who be, who develop symptoms such as fever, most of them will be contagious for a couple of days before they have any symptoms while they're in the so-called incubation period. That's what makes it really hard. The incubation period is roughly five or six days, but can be as long as two weeks. So if you had a theoretical scenario where every single member of your choir was asymptomatic and had not been exposed to anybody else for the previous two weeks and there had been no travel, in that case, you could be as close to perfectly safe as possible. But I, I don't think there are many scenarios in which the risk would be zero. Oh, yeah. No, and I don't think there, the risk uh, would be zero. And I know I disagree with a lot of my colleagues on this point, but I, I don't. the way I think of it is that the risk for going into a group activity, getting a disease, getting a, an infectious disease from somebody in that room, uh, and then possibly having that complications develop that kills you or or you take that disease to someone else who's vulnerable. I can't imagine a scenario where that risk has ever been zero in the course of human history. True. Uh, and, and so uh, so to me, I, I'm not interested in scenarios that get our risk to zero because I don't see that as possible ever. So what I'm interested in is framing the, the risk that we currently face with this new virus into a bigger, I'll call it risk pool, that we've always been comfortable with before. So we were comfortable with whatever risk we were doing, we, we were facing before as a society. And at some point, we're going to have to drop this new risk into a pool of other risks and get comfortable again doing stuff. Um, and so I guess that's what I'm trying to tease out with you and your expert opinion is like, what, at, what are the types of things that would cause us to say, you know what? The risk now, and let's I'll keep that Wyoming County with zero cases for three months in my in my mind as the example, where they might start to say, yes, we know there's the risk isn't zero because of those asymptomatic cases, but it, is it a reasonable thing then to still go ahead and do whatever activity it is that we want to do? Right. I think um, some of the factors that play into that calculus are how many cases, new cases, are being reported in a certain region or a certain city? That number can be skewed somewhat by the availability of testing. So if you suddenly have a bunch of tests available, you can identify cases that and, and show a, an apparent huge increase in in the number of disease of cases of disease when in fact it was more of an issue of testing. But uh, if you look at the number of hospitalizations, I think that's a very accurate metric for determining how prevalent COVID is in a community. So I, I would look closely at that. And if the number of hospitalizations in the community is declining, that, that's a great sign. If the number of new hospitalizations in a day drops to zero, that's a really good sign. But uh, if there are still hospitalizations, then there's, there's going to be a risk of COVID circulating in the community. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes sense. And I think, um, and, and that all of this to me, um, all the things we've discussed so far, the the new and newer information about case fatality, uh, the the information we're going to be getting in the future about infection fatality, uh, certain things, and I want to get your take on this other aspect we haven't touched yet. But things that we are learning now that's new, that are new about the way the virus spreads, what types of you know, I've heard changes recently about uh, whether or not the CDC thinks that it lives on surfaces as much as they thought it did originally. You know, all of those things to me factor into that giant risk calculus pool uh, that, you know, again, with the premise that we can't get the risk to be zero. And so at what point could we think this risk is similar to what we had be we had been comfortable with before? So I, here's an, a way to think about it. I just want you to shoot holes in it if you see holes. 
but I'm going to make up a number here. This is not an attempt to be scientific, but let's say our whole life we've been comfortable with a risk factor of one of a hundred when we leave our house, and and that COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 has come along, and they have bumped and they bumped that risk up to two, two out of a hundred of what we you know when we leave our home. What are the types of things that I need to think about and look for? that tell me that are that it's getting closer to that one out of a hundred risk that that I had before, at which point life resumes. So uh, I I wonder if, you know, is there anything that you've seen that's newish about uh the changes of our perceptions of how the virus spreads that you'd want to fill us in on? Well, yes, there has been a lot of discussion about exactly how effective masks are. There was a major publication yesterday, June 1st, that put together data from a large number of studies around the world that showed that indeed masks are highly effective at reducing a person's risk for acquiring the infection. So that I think is not really even debatable anymore. And I think that people who are going out in public, if they were to wear a mask, they're clearly reducing their risk for acquiring infection. So that would apply to the general public for singers. That's problematic because I suspect that wearing a mask would kind of defeat the purpose if you wanted to get together to sing. But, but my point is that masks do work. Uh, hand washing is, has been for many, many years the bedrock, the most important way of reducing risk of all infections, and it certainly does play a role in reducing the risk of acquisition of COVID. Okay, so back to the masks then. Let's say, again, that if we've got a choir director who's got the the mindset that I'm kind of spinning myself through here, where I say, "All right, so we want to, we're at that risk too, and we're get, or our risk is falling because maybe in my area the case cases are falling, and uh, we're getting closer to that one risk level that we were at before." But I want to just be safe. I'm willing to deal with masks in my choir mm-hmm. rehearsal because I'd rather have a masked choir rehearsal than not one at all. But it, it sounds like if, if wearing the mask helps in a normal situation, it, again, it doesn't take the risk to zero, but it takes the risk down. Would you say that it probably would also take the risk down if I were to sing into a mask? That would be my conclusion. I don't know that there have been any scientific studies that have looked at the risk of COVID transmission in singers who wear masks specifically. But in the general public, it is clear that masks uh, are extremely beneficial. And I have no reason to doubt that that would be the case with with singers wear, wearing masks as well. Yeah, it's. I mean, I just know that for me personally, if I were to be told you can't have a rehearsal without masks, then I would just say, all right, everybody mask up. You know, like I, I would rather have the rehearsal than than not. But that's just my my take. I can also understand how for singers how annoying it would be. Like we can't, we wouldn't be able to hear each other as well, and. There'd, all, there'd be all kinds of other things that would be in play there. But at the same time, if we're looking at this overall big picture of risk, reducing the risk when we're in a rehearsal, that, that would make sense. And, and I know I've seen, we've seen videos floating around of choirs from different places in the world that have gotten together in really small groups and sung in masks and in big spaces and they're spread out and they've been able to make some pretty awesome noises. So that that's cool. Um, I'm going to take you one direction next that's just a little bit a little bit off topic, and then we'll kind of tie this all together. Uh, but I know you're you're kind of an expert on the Spanish flu in, from 1918 as well. You've done a lot of research on that. And, and one of the first things we started hearing when this pandemic came around were, uh, par- probably because it was almost exactly 100 years ago, um, but we started immediately seeing uh, comparisons from the, the Spanish flu uh, to now and how those how we should expect certain parallels to occur and uh, you know you'd see news stories where oh at this point in the Spanish flu they did this and this is what happened and so forth. we should be careful because if we do that and this thing will happen again are are those good comparisons are there way- let me re- I'll rephrase that are there ways that that's a good comparison and then are there ways that that's not a good comparison yes I uh, have had an interest in the 1918 flu. And when I did research in this topic a few years ago, I, I came across a number of recently published articles in which epidemiologists went back to the experience from 1918 to see what the public health officials in those days did that worked and what did not work. 
And the main conclusion was that social distancing worked. For example, closing schools and uh, closing businesses, limiting crowds were very effective measures. And those measures have been used in the COVID outbreak also with a, a great deal of success. But with that said, there are a number of differences. The 1918 flu occurred during a world war. Uh, and so that really changed the dynamic. There were soldiers going all over the country by train and transmitting the virus with them and then carrying it to Europe by ship. Uh, the Probably the single biggest difference is that the 1918 flu affected primarily people between the ages of 20 and 40. So a lot of these young soldiers were dying, whereas COVID is more a disease of older people with the highest mortality rates than those above the age of 65. Okay, yeah, that's a really good point. So in other words, the people who were most at risk of the 1918 flu were also the people who would have been most mobile at the time. So they're, they're people who would have been out and about interacting with people, which is what probably led to that really high death toll and high mortality. Exactly. And the other big difference is that the medical community back in 1918, uh, science was very rudimentary. And they did not know that this was a viral infection. They really had no idea the best way to control the spread of the infection, and they had no treatment, whereas today we're far more advanced, thankfully. Okay, yeah, and that was kind of my instinct too. I felt immediately uncomfortable with those comparisons for the, those reasons. In, the, in other words, I see how there are some parallels anytime you have a pandemic. There's going to be certain things that are are similar. But that's really that's really helpful. It it it, it seemed to me uh, like uh, taking kind of a broad brush to paint a pandemic. Uh, they they're both they're vo- both viral. Uh, outbreaks, therefore, they are both the same. But it, it makes it makes a lot of sense where there would be some some critical differences, especially. I want to see what you think about this, especially the aspect where the, the people, the group that was more vulnerable back then, was the group that is more mobile. It seems to be exactly the opposite scenario to what we're dealing with now. Whereas the people who are the most vulnerable are also the people who, for lack of a, of a better term, have already been on lockdown in the sense that they live in a care home, care facility, they live in, they're in a hospital, they're older, uh, have health complications, and so they aren't as mobile. Is that, a, is that a fair observation? Right, I think as a generalization, that is true. The people that are at the very highest risk are elderly individuals in skilled nursing facilities who can't move. But of course, there are you know, other people that don't fall into that group who are at risk for COVID. Right, of course. Yeah, I, I don't ever want to discount the the um, the exceptions to the rule. I'm just kind of trying to get the the bigger picture. The reason it interests me um, is that if you know, one of the things that I remember when I when this pandemic first started, I started listening to a lot of epidemiology lectures from university YouTube channels, and just not because I thought I could become an expert. Uh, but because I just wanted to understand the frame of reference they were using when they started speaking this this language. All of a sudden, there's an epidemiologist on the news every five seconds, and I wanted to be able to interpret what what I was hearing. And uh, one of the things I learned from going back prior to this and just kind of understanding epidemiology is this idea that that being outside in well-circulated, well-ventilated open air uh, is one of our best uh, scenarios to be in, uh, so that viruses just have they have harder time uh, transferring outside. Now, first of all, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so then my conclusion was, or my thought then became, if that's the case, it makes sense to me that the people who are the most at risk are the people who are stuck inside. Uh, they're they're the ones that are in large groups, especially like a care home. So you're. Um, it's almost like a tinderbox for infection to be all a bunch of people who are older, all, already more vulnerable, and then they're all stuck inside with each other for that whole period of time. That seems like a, an obvious super spreading type event. Yes, close confinement, uh, especially if there are crowds, is the uh, highest risk uh, situation for acquiring COVID. Yeah, and then of course you factor in the age of the people in those care homes. It's just really sad. Um, that's, I think that's one of the things that 
I, I think just doesn't get discussed enough, but that that's probably a topic for, for a different a different <laughs> podcast. Okay, so kind of tying this all all together now uh, with this these the kind of the the background and I guess the the picture that we've painted so far about the risks to different groups of people, um, the the changing information about fatality, mortality, hospitalization rate, um, what types of things spread the disease the most. Uh, if you were to and again, I know you're in private practice, so you're not a government health official. Um, but what types of things do you think, uh, what signals, kind of like understanding, the, interpreting the epi epidemiologist that I was talking about before, uh, if we are looking at the signals being sent to us by our uh, local officials, for a lot of us, that means a, a, a school administrator, that means a you know a local department of health head or whatever, and they're telling us all these stats on, on COVID in our area. Um, what are some signs that you would have us look to, to, to say, hey, the risk is starting to drop where I am? Right. I personally put a lot of trust in what the public health authorities tell us. But if I'm looking at this independently, the main metric I'm going to be looking at would be number of new hospitalizations in my region on a given day. and then. Also, the number of deaths during a, a defined time period of a day or a week. And then I noticed you didn't mention new cases. Is that less important or is that something we should factor into? Yes, the number of new cases is important. But uh, in Missouri, we've had very limited access to testing. Hopefully, over the coming weeks, tests will become much more widespread. And once that happens, there will be an artificial increase in the number of confirmed cases merely because we're now able to get the testing done. I, I see. So your your point being that those it, the new hospitalizations and and deaths, that rate is a better indicator when there's a lack of testing because those things aren't going to change whether there's testing or not. Correct. That's a good point. Okay, that makes total sense. So you could be even if you were doing zero testing, you would see cases coming to the hospital and you'd see people dying if this vi virus was you know, in your area. So that makes a lot of sense, because I, I see right. that a lot whenever I talk with people about uh, looking at the risk in their area, they, they seem to the point completely at, well, we just don't test enough, so there's no way to know. And it, it does seem to make sense that there is there are indicators that we could look at, even if the testing isn't perfect. Correct, the hospitals now do have readily available COVID testing. So someone's admitted to the hospital with fever and shortness of air, they're going to get a COVID test. So that's an accurate metric, the number of new hospitalizations with confirmed COVID. Okay. Yeah, that, that that's very helpful, at least, at least to me. I hope that listeners are tracking with, with that. That's a really, uh, to me, that's a big deal, uh, being able to look at, because everybody's got different um, government structures in their area priorities of politicians play into this of who does who pays for what and all of that and there are that just knowing that there are certain kind of um fixed metrics that we can look at regardless of where we live uh might might be helpful for some people um what what about so i'm going to ask you to kind of quantify certain types of risk activities it, this it's okay if it's rough because i know that this does go a little bit into the philosophy uh, realm here, but let's say if I'm, uh, I'll go back to my uh, almost vacant uh, Wyoming County again, zero cases. We still know that there's some, some risk because of asymptomatic carriers, but relatively low compared to say New York City, Manhattan, right? Very low compared to that. And then putting in the context of singing, right? So if, if I'm gonna sing, in New York City uh, versus if I'm going to, I don't know, go bungee jumping in Wyoming, you know, there, there are certain activities that carry with them risk. Is, is there, do you, first of all, do you see any value of in thinking about the, our overall risk picture by comparing it to other activities that we're used to doing? Yes, you, you raise a good point, which is that some people think of risk as either a, Kind of a binary thing, either there is a risk or there is not, but actually it can be quantitated. And we're at you know some low level of risk for any number of calamities just by function of being on the planet. But but that risk can be quantitated. Right. And you know, is it and so is there 
I, I, one of the things that I think has bothered me is that I've seen people get made fun of online for even attempting to quantitate this risk, um, which I find troubling because to me, this is how, this is how we make decisions. Uh, largely, we, at least if you're making good decisions, you make good decisions based on a, an accurate picture of the world around you as best you can get at the time. Um, so, uh, for example, making fun of the, the idea of uh, comparing the risk to the flu uh, or comparing this this pandemic to and the reason I, I think it, I don't see if you can throw out a better one. But to me, the comparing it to the common flu, it has some um, some really good reasons to do that, but also some reasons that aren't the same, which are that they're two different viruses with different transmission uh, aspects. The reason I think it's still a good idea, though, to compare when we when we track all the information down finally in the final analysis, how much worse is this than the common flu, is simply because that's a risk we're already used. To. Like we we have already factored that into our life. Um, that's that's something we know is a risk when we go out to Christmas shopping in December. Uh, we know it's a risk when we do that, and we've kind of filed it away in the big picture of our risk. So to me, when the, when the data comes in, I kind of look at that in comparison to the common flu. Is that crazy? No, I, I think you're right, and I can give you an anecdote. One of the things I do over and over again every autumn is try to get my patients to take a flu shot. And many of them will tell, or should say some of them will say, I just don't feel like that. I, I don't get flu shots. And I'll say, you know, you could die from the flu. And that doesn't sway their opinion. The risk of dying from the flu is about one in a thousand. But there are a lot of people that are fine with that risk and they don't want to get their flu shot. Right. And as we just saw in that earlier in the episode, I showed the, the CDC estimates right now where the risk of this, if you have symptoms, is four in a thousand but about a third of people don't have symptoms. So that really, you're looking at a real number of closer to 0.3. So let's say three in a thousand. So you're talking about overall to the overall population, a risk that's about three times worse than the flu. Is that, would you say that, the, am I analyzing that correctly? Well, the one in a thousand figure for flu, I think is for documented cases. So the, ah. so, uh, the net number of deaths per actual cases would, would be lower than that. Okay, yeah, and I think the, the, the picture I pulled up here was also, so I think that indicated that that's confirmed cases. Right. So, yeah, so uh, it, so would you say then that, um, I guess back to my original question, if it's if it's point, approximately point, or a three, of a three in a thousand for symptomatic confirmed cases, I guess that takes me back to my original question. That sounds to me like still three times worse than the flu. Well, that's one way of looking at the math. Yeah. My perspective is, um, has been colored by my experience treating people with COVID in my hospital. And yeah. I can tell you that it is a disease that is far, far worse than the flu. So even if there are only three times as many cases as there are flu cases, the impact on an individual and the society I think is magnified because of the severity of the disease. Yes. Now, okay. So that makes a lot of sense to me. So, in other words, it's not it's not just about whether or not it's deadlier by three times, but there are other things to consider too. Like even if you don't die, just a dramatically more destructive disease on the body, um, more long term health effects afterwards, that type of thing. Exactly. People with COVID may be in the hospital for many, many weeks on a mechanical ventilator, and that's quite uncommon with the flu. Okay, right. So that, that's, and that's kind of what I meant before when I was saying that um, I, cannot, I can see why there are good reasons to compare it to the flu, uh, just because, again, not because they're, the, the disease is the same. I'm, I'm, with, I'm with it enough to see that that's not the case. Um, but only that the, the value to me is just calculating that big risk picture that we are that we are used to, but I think that's an important bit of information where you can look at the mortality rate, but you, that's not the whole picture. You've got to look at how it affects people, even if they don't die. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that that, that makes total sense. So as we kind of um, tie this all together, then is there anything that you can think of? You know, I've, I've brought up several just kind of pet peeves that I feel like people don't understand today. 
as a as a physician, as a clinician, are there things that you wish people understood that maybe we either haven't covered or just that that maybe a lay person wouldn't even notice when we watch the news? Yes, I think my biggest pet peeve is if people are relatively cavalier about their personal risk for acquiring COVID because they don't think that they're likely to become very ill. They might be young, physically fit, or what have you. But then if they go and visit an elderly family member, that family member could die Mm -hmm. um, as a result of the uh, transmission of COVID. And so I have actually seen this in my practice where elderly people are quarantined, they stay at home, and then one of the family members comes in, gives some COVID, and the next thing you know, the elderly person is in the ICU for a long period of time. So that's one of the reasons I think it's so important for us as a society to be very careful to reduce transmission of this virus. Yeah, I, I, I see that as well. And there, and to me, and I, I'll kind of throw this theory at you, and it's a little bit political, but to me, that seems to be a symptom of some real tribalism problems that we have where uh, when I when I saw this pandemic starting, I almost immediately noticed that we were dividing into two camps about it. One, wh- one which was saying uh, this virus is fake slash not a big deal. Don't worry about it. All the way to this is the apocalypse and no one should leave their house ever and do anything until there's a vaccine. And it, the more I'm learning about it, it seems like the truth might be somewhere not neither of those things. What do you think about it? Probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's something Dr. Adalja said too, where it's worse than the flu, but it's not the apocalypse. Um, there, are, there are things that, um, that, like you said, effects of the virus that are, that are new and quite scary and should not be screwed with. Um, but at the same time, you know, trying to figure out ways to, we still have to figure out a way to return to life. And I think that's the I think that's the object of this conversation for you to kind of help us think through that uh, and see, you know, what types of things. And of course, in the singing context, many of us, we, you know, especially the people listening to this show, we're not trying to figure out how to get back to singing as safely as we can because it's a hobby. It's because it's our job. It's how we feed our families. It's how we um, pay our mortgage. And so. If if you were to say, and I know you've got um, you've got your do- your stepdaughter that is a friend of mine, Danielle, who is a choir director, and so I know you've probably been having conversations uh, in the home and in you know well, or maybe through Zoom, depending on you know, <laughs> how separate you've had to be uh, over this time. But what would your advice be uh, to let's say somebody like me who? Uh, ultimately, the decision of whether or not my class exists next year is not going to be up to me. It, it's going to be up to somebody above my pay grade. But let's say I'm told that you get to do class because the, the public health official has decided in your area that school can resume. And there's going to be some new rules at school. So there's going to be some distancing rules. There's going to be maybe some maximum class sizes uh, so that you can spread out more. Let's say all those things are in place, right? And you've got uh, some as many mitigators as the school can help us achieve. Do you then, in, just in your opinion, do you, if you're me, do I still tell my classes we're not singing? Or do, do we kind of trust that that whole scenario has been factored into some bigger picture risks and we go ahead and sing with teenagers? I think in the scenario you described, I personally would feel safe proceeding because we do have now abundant data that shows that keeping a distance of more than six feet and wearing a mask and hand washing will markedly reduce the risk of acquiring COVID. Right. And I, and I again, that's for the, the big picture that I keep trying to look at is if I, I keep feeling like the my instinct is that if they feel, the, if the local health officials feel that we can shove 60 kids into a bus, we can shove 300 of them into a cafeteria to eat lunch. Um, we can have 500 of them walking through the hallways uh, at a certain time of the day or whatever, that that the choir environment might not change that risk picture overall as much as we might think it would. 
what are your thoughts? I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Yeah, and that seems to be a rational uh, approach to this. It, I, to me, it seems very strange that if all those other things are happening in a school, that for some reason, the, just the choir by itself would cause a super spreading event, similar to the, what we talked about with the Washington Choir, the Skagit Valley Chorale, where it's kind of hard. It would be hard to to pin down that that's the one thing that caused it. When, especially with teenagers, <laughs> teenagers are going to be there. They they will they will distance when they're being watched by teachers, maybe in the fall. But as soon as they're not watch, we're not watching them. They're not going to be distancing. They're going to have their tongues in each other's throats, and they're going to be doing like things that teenagers do. And the choir, to me, is just going to be one of those many factors that are going to that are going to calculate the total risk. What What are your thoughts about the the risk overall, though? Of uh, you know, you talked about that cutoff being about fifty years old, of uh, where the risk really, really starts to to go up. Uh, and and like we covered before, that does not mean there are not outliers. There are exceptions, and there are people that are stricken with this that are that fall outside of that. But do you think that it's going to be data like you mentioned, referring to the much lower risk for younger people? That is going to be what public health officials use to determine if school gets to happen. I think the public health officials will look at the overall number of cases in the community. And the concern is that even if uh, students are at relatively low risk, they can transmit the virus to their parents or grandparents when they go home. Mm-hmm. So that, that'll be part of the equation in determining when schools can open and return to normal. Right. And will they, uh, will they factor in the new information also about um, how much you know, what the, the best thoughts now about mortality and hospitalization are also, or will that is that a fixed picture from early in the pandemic? No, I, I think they'll factor in current data. The health departments report data Monday through Friday on a daily basis, so that information is immediately accessible to the decision makers in a community. Okay, that's good. That 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 can only be good because, as you mentioned earlier on in the pandemic, the numbers seem can get based on severity bias can get quite a bit scarier looking. Um, and then it kind of changes over time, which has kind of been something that's also been bothering me. But now do you think it's possible that there are more kids that just because they they seem to be at less risk um, might be largely more largely represented in that asymptomatic group? I am certain that scientists are looking into that, but I'm not sure if the data are known at this point or if the studies still need to be completed and analyzed. Yeah, see, and you're passing my test because earlier I said I trust doctors and scientists that when they don't know, they say they don't know. (laughs) That's a really, really important thing. I think everybody should look out for that. Uh, That's awesome. So I I think the, the the big lesson that I'm hoping that we can take out of conversations like this is, and feel free to put a cap on this when I'm done, is that there is still a lot we don't know about the, the final analysis of how, not only how risky it is, but how to treat it. And, uh, you know, all of the factors that we will know a year, a year or two from now, the jury is still out. True? I completely agree. There are probably a hundred or more specific questions centered around COVID, and we don't have answers to most of those questions. Yeah. And then the second thing is there there are, uh, we're still, because that we're so new in that process, and because scientists don't all agree, as we discussed before, uh, there's going to be some level of personal and so, like local societal risk calculation that's going to have to be done based on incomplete information. Um, and so one of the things that would factor into that too are other therapeutics for how to treat this. Is there any, anything that you think we should know about how this is being treated and is there any good news or bad news there? Yes, I have some very good news, which is that there are some therapeutics that appear to be highly effective that we're using in the hospital. So for the more severely ill people in the intensive care unit, there's now an antiviral drug called remdesivir 
there's what's called convalescent plasma, which is a transfusion with the plasma from someone who's previously been infected and has antibodies. And there's a drug that's called a biologic, which is basically uh, a very sophisticated medication that targets one component of the immune system to prevent it from being overly reactive. And all three of those treatments, in our experience, have been effective outside of a clinical trial setting. That's, that is excellent news. Now, I would say, and this is just from reading the CDC website uh, that I was referencing before, a lot of what's pulling that mortality rate down are those therapeutics that you just mentioned, that they're, if the people come in and, and we can help them. Correct. I, I, I think the mortality rate has been improving over the last few weeks as uh, physicians around the country gain more experience with these newer therapeutics. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point. And and I think about uh, as I have never been a doctor, but I can imagine that you also get better at when you see a patient w- once with a problem. The next time you see the patient with another patient with a similar problem, you you become better as a clinician in in helping that person. Is that true? That is definitely true. Typically, what happens is uh, a student doesn't have any experience with the disease, but can learn from this more experienced faculty member. But in the case of COVID, we were all students at the beginning. No one had any experience. And the medical and nursing community worldwide has has gained quite a bit of experience over the past few months. Right. And then the final question then uh, related to therapeutics, or what are your thoughts about the, uh, uh, there there has been a lot of talk about how we should pin our, our, really all of our hopes on a vaccine. Uh, Is that, do you think that's a reasonable uh, thing to to hold off and wait for? I think if we had a, an effective vaccine, it would be a game changer. Basically, the ways that this pandemic can be brought to an end would be permanent social distancing, which is not feasible, or herd immunity in which a high enough percentage of the population become infected that, that there's a lot of immunity in the population as a whole, or a vaccine. So I, I think a, a vaccine would be a game changer. If we have a vaccine that's safe and effective, then the next big hurdle will be to get a large enough percentage of the population to receive the vaccine. Right. And, I, and I, I'm, that part I understand. So especially with the herd immunity scenario, that would, be, that would be similar to what we talked about earlier in the episode where you know herd immunity is fine in one sense, but in the other sense, that, that tiny fraction of that die becomes a very large number at that point. Uh, you've, got, you've got a very tiny percentage of a very large number, and so we want to try to avoid that scenario. Yes, a community pays a steep price to attain herd immunity, so it's, it's best to avoid that. Right. Now, now as, as to my original question about the vaccine, I, I, I do understand that, that it would be a game changer. What I guess I want to know what your thoughts are is how, how realistic do you think it is that a virus or a vaccine that has been tested sufficiently will be available to us quickly? Very good question. Typically, it takes about eight to 10 years from start to finish to develop a vaccine and, and release it for widespread use. It's uh, kind of nerve wracking that this process is being pushed through so quickly because we want to make sure the vaccine is not only a effective, but also safe in a large population. So I doubt that a vaccine can be developed, produced, and released, and be shown to be safe in a period of time of less than a year at the minimum. Yeah, and that's been my concern too, because I, and I, I don't know if you come across this in your, uh, in your practice or in your field, but there's a lot of talk right now about people who are skeptical about a vaccine being our solution uh, become labeled as anti-vaxxers, um, which I find strange because, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but vaccines do have potential dangers and side effects, correct? Vaccines do have potential side effects, correct? Yeah. So to me, it would just it's a question of just, are we going to, like you said, rush through the research that normally takes many, many years in order to 
get a vaccine available to everybody that for a lot of in our community, we've been told that that kind of is our silver bullet that will save choir is when we give a vaccine, then we can safely sing. But that there are there are also potential downsides to a vaccine that hasn't been fully tested and that we should be really careful with that as well. Is that? Yes, it's definitely a balancing act. You want something that works, but is also safe. And there's no vaccine or medication that it's 100% safe. Right. And, and so then we'd have to, again, factor that into the overall risk pool of what is my risk of co- like what is my risk related to getting in COVID or spreading it to a loved one, like you mentioned, versus the risk of an untested vaccine? Is that a will? The, do you think we'll be faced with that catch twenty two? I think we will be. I'm not sure when that time will come, but I would expect that sometime early next year, public health authorities will need to determine if the vaccine. It's effective enough and safe enough to, to be deployed in a large population. Right. And to re- and to reduce the risk overall rather than just trading one risk for another. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And, th- and that to me has been a, a kind of an obvious, again, layperson observation is that if um, nobody that I no no reputable researcher that I've seen has ever presented a vaccine as being a 100% panacea for curing things with no side effects like there are a certain percentage of people that the vaccine just doesn't work on sometimes mm-hmm. there are side effects sometimes the the viruses mutate and you need another one and you know all of this um, so if, if you had to prognosticate just a little bit do you think the increases that you mentioned before that or the increases in effectiveness of treating patients with this with therapeutics and other things might over the course of the next year or two years, you, you could you imagine getting so good at it as a profession that the risk might be brought down lower than a vaccine? Well, the hope is that one day we would have an effective antiviral medication that could be taken as a capsule or a pill in people who are not sick enough to be in the hospital. I don't know when that day will come. At the moment, although these new treatments are, are very promising, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, they have to be given in a hospital setting intravenously and we save them for the sickest people. So they're not really an option for a younger person who has a fever and feels bad but is not ill well enough to be in the hospital. Yeah, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like um, there, I, I guess the reason that interests me and I wanted to pick your mind about it just a little bit is because If they could have a vaccine that's proven safe and I feel comfortable giving it to my children and, you know, within six months and we can go back to life as normal, my goodness, that would be so awesome. But I'm, I kind of want to think about like, well, what if that doesn't happen? And in which case, what types of things would I look for from people like yourself who are treating this? And are, are you getting better enough at it that I might just say, well, I know there's no vaccine, but I, I know that if I get it, the doctors have gotten so much better at treating it that that I'm, I'm still I still have to go to work. Right. the The hope is that over the coming months there will be an increasing number of effective and well tolerated treatments. There are some medications that are being developed that that should be uh, on the market within or at least available uh, to healthcare providers in a few months. So the odds of surviving this should improve as our treatments get better. Right. Yeah, that seems to be uh, such good news to me. And I, and I, 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 my personal feeling on all of this is that if that as time goes on, from everything I've observed and, and from the conversations I've had with people like you and Dr. Adalja and, and watching all these epidemiologists talk on their lecture series, is, is it seems like the overall picture is that as time goes on, the news gets better about what we can do for people, what the risks are. They seem to be going down. Uh, and, and I can't see a reason why the risks would all of a sudden reverse course and become worse. It, it, is there, am I, am I a Pollyanna? No, I, I think you're correct. As, as time goes on, we should, we being the healthcare profession should 
do a better and better job of effectively treating the virus. Yeah, and and that's that's awesome, and I, that seems that's my instinct, uh, just because that's been the case with pretty much every other disease uh, that we just we learn about it, we learn new stuff, we develop new treatments, and I say we like I'm involved in it. You, uh, people like yourself, and you're we as a society, yeah, as a society, right? Uh, we get better, and and we and uh, and so the risk overall for every disease uh, is not what it was a year ago, or not what it was back in the 1918 Spanish flu, or you know, all those types of things. And that's what scientific progress is all about. Uh, anything that I you feel like we didn't get to cover that you want to throw out there before we sign off? I don't think so. This, this was pretty thorough, wasn't it? It was thorough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 think, uh, I think that's why I wanted to have another conversation with an, an, an intelligent clinician and, and person who's in the trenches on this. And I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, but I feel like overall, for my colleagues and, and people who do what I do, um, we've, been looking, uh, we've been looking for a silver bullet um, 100% answer to this problem where it is either we want an answer that says it is not safe to sing at all, or we want an answer to say at, at this point it will be 100% safe again. And and I feel like that just is, is futile. We're not going to find a way towards anything productive that by that line of thinking. And so I wanted to be thorough today just to get your thoughts on what are the different ways that we could be possibly thinking about this? What is the bigger picture? And I, I really appreciate you talking through that. But um, if if you were to be advising again, just myself, um, and and we like to kind of recap this earlier, where people in my area that I should trust, like my local health officials, tell me it's safe to go back to work, and we're going to do stuff. Where maybe it looks it's a new normal, but we we're going to do certain things again. Um, my my personal instinct is that I trust experts like yourself and I trust the local health officials and I trust the, the improvement in the therapeutics that are coming along to where I'm going to make a decision for based on my own risk tolerance. But I also at some point have to, like you said, I, I don't want to be cavalier about other people's risks. But I do have to, at some point, trust that they're also doing their own risk calculation in leaving their house and going out into society and doing that. Or else, like you said, that permanent social distancing, which is not fe feasible, becomes we get stuck there. Uh, it, it, any final thoughts on that issue? Yes, it's, it's a balancing act between trying to get back to a normal life, but trying to be as safe as possible. I do think there may be some long term changes as a result of this pandemic. And it's mm -hmm. possible, for example, that healthcare workers in a hospital will wear masks every autumn and winter uh, to reduce the risk of COVID and other respiratory infections, which is something that we've not done in the past. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. And I remember, I even think in my personal life, um, I teach voice lessons. My wife teaches voice lessons and we have a studio built in our, in our, our basement, we're very fortunate that we have a, a big basement where we can do a lot of spacing. Um, and we're talking about when we, you know, when we redesign the studio for this new new normal, um, putting the kids in front of an open window so that the, the ventilation is as, as good with natural air as we possibly can, increasing the distance between the, the teacher and the student about 15 feet or so, um, as opposed to my wife in particular, who does that for her full-time job, uh, her normal, her old normal, was the student standing right over her shoulder, looking down over the piano and singing right into her face. And one of the things we noticed for years is she gets sick all the time. Like she's constantly sick because the kids, she has 35 students, and they bring their germs in all day long and they sing right into her face. And we're thinking, well, maybe this new normal could, this new setup of your studio could just improve your overall health. That's an excellent point. And the hope is that people will develop less cases of flu and common cold, et cetera, uh, as, as a result of lessons we've learned from the COVID pandemic. 
Yeah, and I, I hope that's the case. And I, I really appreciate you shedding your light on, on all of those issues. And I, this has just been incredibly illuminating and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. I want to do a real quick shout out after that conversation to Danielle Enriquez Fowler, a friend and colleague from here in Kansas City who set me up with this conversation today. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, this is Danielle's stepfather. Danielle is a choir director in my area, and that's a hugely helpful connection to find an expert opinion to talk through this issue with. Well, you made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for listening to the entire conversation. That is such an important part of the picture that we are missing these days in our conversations. They, these conversations are really harmful when they happen online because there is a lot of context that we cannot dive into with back and forths on social media. So the fact that you are still here listening to this says a lot about your mind and says a lot about who you are as a person to be able to sit through and listen to an entire conversation. That being said, I am under no illusions that everyone who listens all the way through will agree with the way I'm thinking about this. But that's not my point. My point is not to get you to agree with me. My point is to get us to acknowledge more broadly that there is more to this equation than simply a risk binary. There are, there's information out there that suggests, as you just heard, that that is the case and that that picture is constantly changing, which means that it, by its definition, cannot be a binary because the, the information is constantly changing. So that's been the effort here at this show to, to get that to happen. If you are a supporter of that effort, that these are the things that I really need your help with. Share. Share the link to my website that has this episode. Share the link to the YouTube channel that has the episode. If you are an Apple podcast user, like and leave, a, and leave a rating. These are all things that help people see the show. And I think you would agree by this point that this is important information that most people are not considering. And so that has been, again, the goal. If you share that goal, please help with that uh, the best you can. I know it's hard. Uh, you have to be pretty brave to be able to post information that goes against the majority line of thinking. I get that. It's one of those things that just my whole life has made my circle of friends very close and very small because I've never had that I've never had that fear. It doesn't bother me to say what I think. It doesn't bother me to have people think I'm stupid. But what does bother me is when conversations get so one-sided that people cannot have open discussions about this about topics. And that's happening like crazy right now around in a lot of topics, but I'm going to stay focused on COVID-19. It's happening to us there too. And again, like I said at the beginning of our episode here today, we do that to ourselves at our own peril. Uh, we're we're going to destroy our profession if we can't have these open-ended conversations where people ask questions and one person says, yeah, that's that's good, but I think you missed this. And here's something we should talk about and what we should think about. And that's been uh, hopefully what we achieved today. And if it needs to happen, I will continue to go down this path. Uh, I will continue to seek out expert opinions and expert discussions. I'm just going to play it by ear. Uh, if I feel like uh, we're starting to open up our conversation as a, as a profession to these other aspects of the, the problem, then maybe I'm, my voice will no longer be needed and my the work will no longer be needed. I don't know, but I'm willing to stick with this all the way through. Um, this is the art form that I love. This is my job. This is how I support my children's lives. I know that's true for you. So I'm willing to fight for every scrap of information that I can find. So we will continue to do that. And we will continue to try to find the perspectives that we need to find in order to expand our understanding of this very complicated, very complicated and ever-changing picture of the coronavirus pandemic, COVID-19. So thank you so much for your listening and for your support. We'll see you next time.